Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone who has interacted with me on our various Potterless social media. Twitter has especially shined in this regard, but shout out to everybody who's interacted on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or sent emails to the Gmail account. It's just been so fantastic to interact with you guys over the course of this journey, and people have really been going above and beyond doing things like sharing the podcast or telling their friends to listen to the podcast or making fan art. Like, there have been some Inktober posts, one uh, most recently referencing the last episode, someone did a drawing of a Dementor wearing a kilt, and it was amazing. So thank you guys so much. It's, It's so much fun to interact with you guys on social media because I view Potterless as a team effort. It is us on this journey together. It's not just me. We're all in this together, to quote High School Musical. And I love interacting with you guys about the episodes individually or about the podcast as a whole or just talking about Harry Potter in general. It's so much fun to do, so I really encourage you guys to join in on the discussions. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Gmail, whatever it is, I would love to hear from you guys. And thank you to everybody who's posted about the podcast. And speaking of thanks, it's time to thank our newest Patreon supporters. So shout out to our new patron, Stephen Para and Hannah Bands, and a huge shout out to Deborah Wilkes, who upgraded to producer level status. She joins the ranks of Andreas, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Michael, Sadie, Emily, Chandra, Jesse, Maggie, and Natalie, who never forget where their cars are located in parking lots. So without further ado, let's get into episode 26 of Potterless, starring Lauren Shippen of the Bright Sessions podcast, covering chapters 9 and 10 of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. <laughs> Welcome back to Potterless, the journey of a 25-year-old man reading a series of children's novels for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert, and today I have a very special guest. You may know her from the Bright Sessions. Her name is Lauren Shippen, and she's an amazing human being. Lauren, how is it going? It is going great. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, thank you for being here. I'm very excited. Me too. Ever since... We met at your fantastic podcasting pool party, which I'm officially calling that the name of it. Uh, We met and everything was great and I was very excited to have you on the show from that moment. Excellent. I will talk about Harry Potter literally any time, so I'm super excited about this. Perfect. Well, that's what we're going to do for a couple of hours. Yay. So this is chapters 9 through 14 of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, which is a fun, fun little section. So I say we just get right into it. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So we begin with... Chapter 9, The Woes of Mrs. Weasley. So basically, Harry meets up with Arthur to talk about the trial after Dumbledore peaced out in, in, in like a rush to not tell Harry anything about yeah, what's going like on. Yeah, just like cold-shouldered Harry, big time. <laughs> yeah, like I've got more important things to do than tell you anything. <laughs> Arthur is super surprised that they use the entire wizard court. He thought that was just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, for like a 14-year-old kid, or I guess he's 15 now. Yeah, 15-year-old kid for such a minor offense. They bring in the whole, what's it? It's like the wizard gamut or whatever? The, the wizen gamut? The wizen gamut. <laughs> wizen gamut, yep. That's I think fun... that's how it's pronounced. There's so many things in Harry Potter that I, I don't know how they're pronounced yeah yeah, you just gotta wing it (laughs) people yell me people correct me on twitter because everyone on twitter knows how to pronounce everything but hell though i mean like unless you hear jk rowling (laughs) talk about it there's a lot of stuff that doesn't end up in the movies like they never i don't think say wizen gamut in the movies Ooh, maybe they don't. Maybe they, I don't, well, I don't know. She should have released a pronunciation guide. Yeah, because like should be. I, Everyone on Twitter was correcting me that I said, hold on, par- not not Parvati, but Parvati is apparently the correct way. But I didn't Wait, see it. Wait, it is? Parvati line. is the correct pronunciation? I think pronunciation? so, just because, I think I could be super wrong, but I'm pretty sure for names of Indian descent, you put more of the emphasis on the first syllable. So that might be why it is. Uh. But I had a, a couple of people on Twitter be like, oh, you're actually an idiot. So, well, so. I didn't know that either. And it's, I, I yeah. guess audiobooks would be where people get oh. pronunciations from. I, I, never, mm-hmm. I only listen to the audiobooks like sometimes with my sister. So I, I never really like that wasn't mm-hmm. part of my experience necessarily. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, anyway. Uh, as as they're leaving with Arthur Weasley, they bump into Lucius Malfoy and Fudge, which is a great combination Ugh. of people to run into. <laughs> Malfoy, of course, takes time to shit talk Harry and Arthur in front of their faces. Yep. And then leaves with Fudge for a secret meeting that they don't yeah. say what it is. It's it's so he Lucius Malfoy is the sketchiest person on the face of the planet. Oh, yeah, he's I, the worst. He's the worst. 
he's really bad. <laughs> Arthur describes to Harry uh, that basically Lucius gets gets on away and gets away with so many different things just by throwing gold all over his problems. Just like giving, giving all this money into the ministry allows Lucius to be Lucius Malfoy. I have to say there was stuff in these five chapters that I was like, oh, this is hard to read right now. Given the current yeah. political climate, no, it was uh, yeah, <laughs> lot, lots of fun stuff where, and and I feel like a lot of people on Twitter are always trying to make these Harry Potter references where they're like, oh, you know, is Comey Snape and all this other stuff, and some people are like, this <laughs> is kind of lame, one. but then but then the more the <laughs> the more that I read the books while this is going on, I'm like, oh well, actually, <laughs> like especially in these chapters, how. Uh, what's the the daily profit is yes. very much like the whole media thing. I think that's the biggest parallel. Yeah, because you get into a section in in these chapters where P Hermione has to explain to Harry, well, like for the past two months, people have only seen headlines saying that you and Dumbledore are crazy, and I'm like, oh wow, this is very much our lovely president uh, telling everyone that every media outlet is wrong is a, except yeah. for these two outlets, and uh, it's very parallel, yeah, which is scary. It's hashtag <laughs> fake news, Daily Prophet. Like, just oh, a garbage newspaper. <laughs> Fun stuff. Yeah, the, the Daily Prophet's terrible. Why is there no... It's there's, terrible. There's no other newspaper in the world. I know. It's like, you have that and then the, the Quibbler, which you learn about, and it's yep. like, that's it. It's like, cool, we have TMZ and Fox News, and that's all we have in the Wizarding yeah, World. Yeah, the Quibbler is basically like, uh, what is it, like the National Enquirer. It's like basically, yeah, you know, really like... Three-headed baby born, you know? Mm -hmm. And the Daily Prophet is like Fox News. And the fact that there's no other media is just crazy. It's terrifying. It's like, really the scary. scope of the Wizarding World in England in general is really, like, I, it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Mm -hmm. And in reading these chapters and, like, all the stuff in the dorm with the, you know, the fifth years and the fact that there's, like, what, six boys in the fifth year dorm. And then if you do the math on that for, like, four houses... There just aren't that many wizarding students. Like, Hogwarts isn't that big. No. I don't know. I get really fixated on these things. No. Like, I, how many wizards are there in England? I want them. Yes. I'm so confused by everything. Like, I, <laughs> I feel like there needs to be, like, a spinoff book where she just, like, lists statistics to clarify yes. everything. <laughs> like, annual or enrollment in Hogwarts, average population. Because the thing is, it seems like the wizarding world is small. And then they have the World Cup. And they're like, it was 100,000 people. And right. it sold out. It's like, where are they all coming from? Are they, is like, it every wizard attends the, the Quidditch World Cup? <laughs> Cup, like. Everybody comes. I mean, granted, traveling is very easy for them, but that is true. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, so anyway, after they see this meeting between the two, Harry goes to the fountain in the middle of the lobby and then dumps out a bag of galleons into the fountain. First off, was he? Where did this bag of galleons come from? I did mean, Harry's just loaded. Like he just ha he just <laughs> travels around with tons of cash. With bags of galleons. But it's so funny because I really the statue. Like I remembered the statue moment very well because that like that statue. Mm -hmm. Like not really a spoiler, but like that's you know it comes into play later, both symbolically okay. and, and, and literally. Um, mm, interesting. And it's, it's an interesting statue, but I don't remember him dumping a bunch of money into it. And I'm trying to remember like. What what was the motivation for that? Like, why the was he just... The only thing I can think is that maybe he was disgusted at Arthur saying that gold kind of gets Lucius anywhere. And Harry's mm. always not enjoyed that. So maybe he symbolically was like, I don't want this to control me kind of thing. Yeah. It's the only thing I can really think of. Such a such a rich person stance to take <laughs> on things, Harry. <laughs> yeah, he's so well off. He should be like, oh, screw these guys. Like, he should have just given them to Ron. Yeah, honestly. exactly. <laughs> like, your best friend is so poor. Like, what if he tells her, oh, how's your day, Harry? Oh, I dumped, I dumped 100 bucks in a fountain. I'll be like, what the fuck is wrong with you, Harry? <laughs> Except it's on. way more than 100 bucks. I remember seeing this thing, this like infographic once about like the actual conversion rate of like pounds yes. to galleons. And like one galleon is like 18 pounds. Okay. I've, or maybe it's I've, more than that. I can't. I've seen, I've seen one thing where it was like a galleon is like 10 bucks. And I've seen other where it's like $7. And I don't okay. know where the pound is, especially now with hashtag Brexit. This is true. But it's, it's not a tiny amount of money. No, like if it's you have significant. a sack of galleons, you're, you're packing pretty well. Like you're yeah. doing all right. And he just dumps it into a like, fountain. Screw, like, it's not a bunch of pennies, Harry. You get it no, <laughs> it's a racist fountain. Don't reward it. <laughs> okay. So, dumps the galleons, and then they head back to the headquarters. Hermione and the Weasleys are extremely ecstatic that Harry is innocent, as they should be. And there's this great moment where Ginny and the twins keep <laughs> chanting, he got off, he got off, in the background <laughs> while while Sirius and Mrs. Weasley and all these people are trying to talk to Harry. They just, like, keep being his hype man in the background, like, he got off, he got <laughs> off, <laughs> which is so good. I love it. And I, oh, I... I have a you know a number of issues with the with the movies, but I think my, my two mm -hmm. biggest are like the fact that Ron and Ginny both got s like just the short end of the stick in terms of their characterizations, where they made Ron the buffoon and they made Ginny just like 
sort of personality list, but it's yeah. uh, like throughout the book, she's always goofing off with Fred and George. And like, that's so mm-hmm. much fun. Like she's so great in the books and Ron is, I, I, I will defend Ron. A lot of people don't love Ron. I love, oh, Ron, I love Ron. Okay. Thank big, you. I'm a big Ron proponent. I made one of my tweets is like, I ranked the Weasleys and I had, I had Ron Oh, controversial. <laughs> Who was number Ron one? Really Oh, it was Fred and George interchangeably. Yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had I had Bill super low because it was before I knew Bill was like kind of cool. This is when it was just like Bill works at the bank, and I was like, "What a loser!" But then everyone was like, "No, no, no, he bra- he's like Indiana Jones for the bank." And I was yes. like, oh, "Okay, never mind." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like a code breaker, and he has an earring and long hair, and he's like mm-hmm. super badass. Yeah. Well, not '90s badass, but not not modern day. Th- that that is true. <laughs> But you're right is the only knowledge I have of Harry Potter before I read these books was I saw the first four and a half movies. And from what I knew in the movies, I was like, Ginny's kind of boring. So every time Mm -hmm. she does something cool in the books, I'm like, whoa, Ginny's super cool. Yeah. Because at first I was like, why does Harry marry Ginny? She seems so lame. But now as I read it, you're right. More and more, Ginny is sweet and like she's funny and a good friend and a good person also their stuff and i feel like in the movie she's just like background oh yeah she's a redhead girl too and that's literally all you know yeah, about her is exactly that she exists and it, it just you know like it's just sort of like oh harry got together with her because it's like she's part of ron's family and like he wanted to like you know and that's that's just that sucks because that's not how it is in the books because she's actually really yeah. awesome and she's like a really good yeah. witch and she's really badass and like mm-hmm. yeah same thing with ron where they make him the buffoon and he's actually like he stands up for Harry a lot and yes. is a good dude. And like, I don't know, like the fact that he's like this, this poor kid who has hand-me-downs for everything. And the moment he meets Harry, he offers him like half of his sandwich is just, yeah. I think that says so much about who Ron is. Oh yeah. I loved that moment. That yeah. was one of my favorite Ron moments. And now I just love every time he tells a good joke, he's getting, <laughs> he's getting better and better. Every book at like snarky com- com- comebacks and remarks. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> So they're chanting, he got off, he got off. And Harry mentions to the squad that his scar is hurting pretty much all of the time now. And Mrs. Weasley finally yells, shut up, in all caps (laughs) and exclamation points at her kids in response to the chant, which is fantastic. Um, Mrs. Weasley's stock is rising so fast in this book. Molly is coming into her own, and I love it. (laughs) Over the next few days, Harry notices that Sirius seems to kind of be bummed that Harry is going back to Hogwarts, which Hermione thinks is super selfish, but Harry and Ron are defending him. And they hit her with a simultaneous come off it, which is my favorite. I love when they say British stuff because I feel like you don't get that in the movies either. Yes. And these books I are so British. British <laughs> yeah. I love saying things like, oh, come off it. And come then there's off another it. thing they say multiple times, which is like something about a Mickey, which I think means making fun of. I, yeah, I, taking I the Mickey. Is to taking make fun the of Mickey, something. which I don't yeah. know what the hell that means at all. But I feel like <laughs> in the movies, they're just not British enough. <laughs> It's Which true. They did try British to, I think, people. like, Americanize it a little bit. And it's, mm-hmm. they're so, I think, yeah, reading this, I was like, oh, my God, they're so British. I, I miss mm-hmm. people talking this way. Yes, it's Yeah, great. it's really fun. So, yes, they, they hit her with a double come off it when she says that Sirius was probably just hoping that Harry doesn't have to go back to Hogwarts so that they can be outcasts together. I, I am with Hermione on this 100%. Oh, 100%. Like, 100%. I love Sirius, but I kind of forgot, like, Honestly, how much of a whiny bitch she can be. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, I get true, that though. he, you know, like, he's had a really rough go of it. You know, it's like he lost yeah. his best friends. He got betrayed. He was in Azkaban forever. But the whole, like, using Harry as a stand-in for James really mm-hmm. sucks. Like, that, that just sucks. And it's, and it's like, that's exactly basically what Snape does, too. And neither of those mm-hmm. things are good. And obviously, for yeah. Sirius, it's like, it's a positive thing in Sirius's mind, as opposed to, in Snape's mind, it's a negative thing. But mm-hmm. I don't know. It just it really bothers me. I'm like, you're a grown man. Like, you yes. need to stop treating this 15-year-old as if he's, like, your best friend and you're back at school. Yeah, you do kind of learn in these chapters that Sirius is a bit more immature than he seems to let on, which yeah. is kind of similar to the James Potter thing. Like early on, you're like, oh, James Potter is a saint. And then you realize he's kind of more similar to Fred and George than anyone. Yeah. And then with this one, you think Sirius Black is like great and you're like calculated and has it all together. But then he starts to do stuff like go with them to the train station as a dog. And then yeah. later when he's writing the letter, he's like, how about we meet up in Hogsmeade? Or when he's in the fireplace, it's like, how about we meet up at Hogsmeade? And you kind of learn more and more. You're like, oh, wow, Sirius is not necessarily the most responsible. Like, yeah. I'm so afraid he's going to slip up and get caught. And it's like, dude, people think you murdered 13 people. This is not good. <laughs> I know. And then he's like, when Harry's like, no, I don't think that's a good idea because Harry's trying to protect him. 
he's like, oh, well, you know, your dad would have mm-hmm. thought the risk was fun. And it's like, okay, yeah. dude. Like, like, he's not his dad. You're, and he's you're a murder dad. suspect. Like, I know that you, like, <laughs> didn't do it, but yeah. people think that you did, and you escaped from, like, the most, like, locked down prison ever. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's, I, you know, it's like, it, it is tough because what he was in prison from age 21 to 35 like that's yeah rough. so you lose the you know it's like years. yeah you didn't get to mature because you were in isolation and like with dementors for 15 years but mm-hmm. or for 12 years or whatever it is but it's still it's like don't you not want to go back there yeah <laughs> like shouldn't yeah, you like, like seems like a terrible place yeah shouldn't you just be laying low while this all gets worked out oh, uh, and that being said i do love serious but it's like it's out of love that I, I want to smack yes, him upside yes, the head yes. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, of course. So Hermione again brings up Spew uh, oh, and God. saying like, oh, we should do a sponsored common room cleaning. And Ron mutters under his breath to Harry like, oh, I'd sponsor you to shut up about <laughs> Spew. Just, oh, Ron is just killing it. <laughs> Harry keeps daydreaming about Hogwarts and he's honestly kind of bored at the Order of the Phoenix since the members are always gone. Mrs. Weasley keeps them out of the meetings and they don't really see anything. And this is exactly what Ron and Hermione told him at the beginning when he got all pissed at them, but he didn't listen to them. And he's like, oh, wow, it's kind of boring here. It's like they tried to <laughs> tell you this and you were having none of it. Uh, I mean, he is the real whiner in this book. That's, oh I think, God. you know, why a lot of people don't. I, in retrospect, love this book because after reading the sixth and the seventh book and then rereading the fifth, I was like, okay, this, like, I, I have a greater mm-hmm. context for, like, what you were going through. Like, yeah. I, and I also think that, you know, I read this before I was 15 because it came out when, you know, when we were, like, 11 or 12. Yeah. And... Then reading it after I had been a 15-year-old myself, I was like, oh, yeah, no, like, we are all like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, Hermione is the only, like, non-terrible 15-year-old in this entire book. Yeah, exactly. And even she is terrible sometimes, you know? Sometimes, yeah. She, yeah. No, she's not perfect either. But I get it. And and you're, you're right. Like, when I got – there was a point, and, and this came in the last episode, there was a point where if I wasn't doing Potterless, I probably would have skipped a couple chapters because <laughs> I was just like, dude, Harry, shut up. Like, he's being so annoying. But well, I, I, think, I, I think that's one thing that, like, mo- more mo- most people tell me five is their least favorite book. But I think in retrospect, like, when people go back a second time or, or after you know the ending, you kind of get it, and it puts it all in perspective. Yeah. So – I think it makes sense. Harry was never my favorite character until the seventh book. And okay. then it became one of my favorite characters because of what happens in that. And then I, I yeah, I, I kind of have a lot more, not that I didn't respect him before, but I, I feel like I understand him a lot more and I feel like I, yeah. I connect with him a lot more. But I have to say, I was relieved when you were like, let's do chapters nine through 14. Cause I was like, thank God it's after he's done with like his <laughs> like moody Dursley, like, <laughs> Oh God, those first couple chapters in this book are, are brutal. Like the, the, the first they couple chapters of every book are always like not that yes. fun. Cause you're just at the Dursleys and you're waiting to go back to mm-hmm. Hogwarts. But these mm-hmm. ones, especially. Yeah. It was pretty rough. Yeah. It was a pretty slow start. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron and Harry get their book list. And the book completely breezes over the fact that they throw something into the trash can and the trash can swallows it and burps and they act like this is not the <laughs> coolest trash can ever. Like, are you kidding me? I want one right I don't think now. I even really noticed that. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> See, God, that's the other that. joy of me with this podcast is I nitpick everything and I notice every <laughs> single thing because I'm reading these with the finest tooth comb and that shit is dope. Like, I want that <laughs> so badly. <laughs> Like, Grimald Place is, like, so dusty and weird, but it also is mm-hmm. a pretty cool house. Yeah, they got some cool stuff. Yeah. On. Fred and George apparate in, and they say that they heard Dumbledore had a hard time getting a defense against the dark arts teacher, which is like, yeah, of course, like, bad shit happens yeah. to, the def- to the Dada teacher every single book. And then George raises this exact concern, and then Harry's like, oh, yeah, one sacked, one dead, one memory's <laughs> removed, and one locked in a trunk for nine months. And it's like, yep, this does not seem like an ideal position. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so then Ron's letter says that he's a prefect, which I had to close the book because I was <laughs> like, no, <laughs> like there is no way. <laughs> and and everyone is as shocked as Ron was, as I am. Yeah. Everyone feels it's, exactly no one saw the coming. <laughs> the twins said that they thought it was going to be Harry. Hermione comes in the room. And when she does, Harry is holding Ron's badge. And Hermione's like, oh, Harry, I knew it. And Harry says, oh, Actually, this is Ron's and Hermione like slips up and at first goes, are you sure? And then quick like tries to cover her tracks, which is fantastic. Oh, God. 
<laughs> Mrs. Weasley is also incredibly shocked, but then starts freaking out and is very happy. And then she has an amazing quote where she's like, oh, that means everyone in the family so far has been a prefect. And Fred and George say, what are we, next door neighbors? Which is, ah, uh, 10 out of I 10. love like, that comeback. It's so good. Uh, they're like, oh, man. So good. I think the, the peak of J.K. Rowling's writing in these books is the snarky comments made by members of the Weasley family. Like, yes. consistently, those are my favorite parts of everything is just whether it's Fred and George making a joke or Ron having like a sassy thing mumbled under his breath. Or Ginny like giving her mom side eye. Like there's a yes. lot of that. <laughs> it's, like JK really comes to shine. And it makes sense because if you look at her Twitter feed, like 98% of her tweets are just pure sass. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense of why she's so it makes good so at much it. <laughs> I think one of my favorite Weasley interactions though is, I guess this is like the first book. I don't know. The first time that Harry goes to the burrow. And that, like yeah. Arthur sits down, and he's like a little confused about if he has another kid or not. And he says something <laughs> like, "Like, are you one of ours?" Just <laughs> because he has so many kids. You just keep can't keep track. You can't keep oh. track. I love that. <laughs> it's so good. So she says that she's going to give Ron a reward for doing so. And he says, oh, can I have a new broom? And this sets the stage for my Quidditch prediction, which I think I've mentioned in, in the last episode, but I'm not sure. This is a, a big theme of the Potterless podcast <laughs> is that I try to predict everything. And I'm usually wrong. I love I was it. Thoroughly, I was thoroughly convinced that Ludo Bagman was the bad guy in the fourth book. <laughs> I was like so confident. And for multiple episodes, I was like, yo, it's totally him. And then it wasn't. <laughs> so, But this one, I'm 100% sure. And I read enough to know I'm true. But uh, I right away, I'm like, okay, Ron's going to make the Quidditch team. There's an opening at Keeper. Oliver Wood is gone. Ron just got a new broom. It's going to be him. <laughs> and I was very happy to know that in the last yes. chapter of this, I was correct. So you are correct. Kind of, I'm redeeming myself for some of my terrible predictions. <laughs> I also thought that um, when Hermione was going to multiple classes, I thought that she was splitting into like clones of herself and then going to classes at the same time. I mean, that's not like th that more outlandish than what the <laughs> real thing time was. Travel that yeah, they exactly. Use once time and travel. Like, oh, we don't use time turners anymore, guys. <laughs> that would make things too easy. So. Fred and George yeah. make fun of Ron. They, they make fun of him, and then they're like, oh, no, wait. He might put us in detention. And Hermione's like, hey, he could. And then they say, well, looks like our days of lawbreaking are finally over. <laughs> Which, ah, uh, amazing. They disapparate to the room upstairs and then start laughing about the situation. <laughs> Which is so good. There's and then so Ron much. goes on to tell Mrs. Weasley that he wants a clean sweep so that she doesn't feel bad about not being able to afford a Nimbus, which yeah. is incredibly kind of Ron. Just yeah. very thoughtful, good Like he out. knows. He knows that his family can't afford that. Mm -hmm. He's not trying to be selfish. For a 14-year-old kid, he's very aware of his parents' financial well-being, which I do not think was anything that ever crossed my mind. No. As a kid. Definitely not. And it's not like I grew up in a super rich household where like money wasn't an option, but I guess it's just like... At, at a, such a young age, I just, like, didn't process the concept of money and salary and all that stuff. So I think it's, like, awesome for Ron to know, yeah. oh, hey, maybe I should make sure that my parents aren't spending a bunch of extra money on a broom when that's really not the most important thing. Like, super thoughtful. Yeah, it's very – he is very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Harry is fake happy for Hermione after Ron leaves. So, like, Ron goes out of the room to tell Mrs. Weasley the twins are gone. It's just Harry and Hermione. And Harry is fake happy for her. And she asks if she can use Hedwig to write a letter to her parents. And then when she does, Harry just like sulks into his bed. <laughs> He's so emo. <laughs> so emo. He realizes he forgot the prefects were chosen in this fifth year, but then admits to himself. He's like, uh, well, I if I did remember, I totally would have been expecting it. And I totally would have been <laughs> super upset that I didn't get it. Uh, and here's a concern because Harry... There's no fucking way you're going to be a prefect. No. You get into trouble every single year. You're bad at classes. You don't pay attention to classes. You copy all of your homework from Hermione. You literally ended the previous year holding your classmate's <laughs> corpse. Yes. Like, and they just don't reward that. <laughs> you are last place or first place in the negative sense of points deducted from <laughs> Gryffindor. Like, you have more than the rest of your entire house combined, I'm sure. You get points deducted all of the time. Uh, and, There's like, no break every rule. <laughs> like, yeah. you're constantly sneaking around the castle after hours. Yes. Uh, you helped a criminal <laughs> escape in your third year. <laughs> <laughs> like and stole a, a, a creature that was made for execution like you've mm -hmm. broken so many rules why on earth and I, I know that like Ron and Hermione were along for all of that stuff but like sure Hermione obviously like is gonna be prefect and then yeah. you know Ron 
I, I mean, I guess there's not really a lot of other boys in the year. I mean, Neville, I guess, could have been prefect, but Neville... But Neville is so bad. He's just th- so bad at things. At least the way the book describes him. He's so bad at all of the stuff that makes you actively be a wizard. So he's yes. good at book things like herbology. But yeah. He's terrible at defense against the dark arts. But I'm glad that in, in, in a couple chapters, they start saying nice things about Neville, which is the first time the narrator <laughs> or any character has been nice to Neville. Like, no one has been nice to Neville the I entire know, series. Poor Neville. And I... now in this book, they're like, you know what? He's not so bad. He's not terrible. <laughs> and it's because he, like, finally starts to, like, have interests, you know? It's like yeah. he gets, like, the cactus and he, like, I, he gets more of a personality. And, I mean, I guess that, what was it? It was in first year that he stands up to them when they're trying to sneak off. Or no, is it? It's, yes. That was the first one because it was the yes. technicality where the only the only reason they got ten <laughs> the points house cup was is... because Neville did what you're supposed to do. Neville was brave. Ten points. That's because he got Griffin petrified, like or not petrified. He got stunned. Yeah, he got stunned. He stood up. Ten points. That was some Dumbledore bullshit because otherwise you should give every Ravenclaw ten points when they study because that's what it's Ravenclaws true. do. Well, and it's it's, super dumb. it's like I think that that's where Harry, despite being this like. Not a not a very good student and a horrible rule br- yeah. rule breaker and lawbreaker. Mm-hmm. Why he expects it to be prefect is because like he is Dumbledore's favorite, you know. And mm-hmm. and yes. I, I think what's so interesting about Harry and what feels so real to me about Harry, especially in this book, is that he he hates being the center of attention. Mm-hmm. He hates the burden that's been placed on him. But at the same time, he also expects to get anything that he wants yeah, <laughs> in like he a weird really way. Does. He's and, very selfish. Yeah. Well, it's not, yeah, it's like selfish and he's just very arrogant, Cause mm-hmm. it, I, which makes total sense because it's like he spent so much of his life not getting anything that he wants. Yeah. And then to find out like, oh, you're the chosen one of the wizarding mm. world, which you didn't even know existed. <laughs> yeah. And yes, you can do magic and you're incredibly powerful and everybody's falling over him. Like it's bound to go to your head, you know? And I think that mm-hmm. like that to me always, always felt very, very real. Yeah. Even if it's like mm-hmm. kind of douchey. Nah, but <laughs> such it such is Harry. Yeah. So he he goes through this internal debate about whether or not that he's better at at stuff than Ron because he's thinking, oh well, now the only thing I'm better at Ron at is Quidditch, and that made me think, oh man, when Ron joins the Quidditch team, he's gonna be so mad. But spoiler alert, he's not mad. <laughs> Ron is terrible so, at Quidditch. <laughs> yeah, right away. Well, yeah, but also when Ron's like, hey, I I tried out for, or I'm gonna try out for the team. Harry's initial reaction is like, awesome. Where I was convinced Harry was gonna be like, oh no, now Ron does everything I do. <laughs> like I thought he was gonna be the sassiest, but I think Harry knows <laughs> that he's a much much better flyer than. Ron. Ron. Oh, so so it's okay. You know, because they like will play Quidditch, like you know, when they're when he's at the burrow and stuff. That's and, true. Like, and mm-hmm. that is one thing that Harry legitimately is incredibly good at is flying. Mm-hmm. Like true. he is a very good Quidditch player, and he's good at defensive magic. Like those are the two things that you know. Yeah. He can hang his hat on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> he has he has some selfish thoughts back to him saving them, which he had earlier when he was mad at them at the house, saying, oh, you know, I'm always saving them, blah, blah, blah. He also then starts thinking, well, maybe everyone's right. Dumbledore is crazy for making Ron the prefect. But then ultimately he's like, no, 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 never mind. You know what? I'm going to take the high road. When Ron comes back, I'll be nice. And he does that. So thankfully he only has negative thoughts and then does good actions. Yeah, and it's still like a good bro. Yes, definitely. All of Ron's insecurities about like not being as good as Harry are, are like, totally yeah. justified because it's like Harry is oh, thinking 100%. all of those things. A hundred percent. Mrs. Woozy comes back in with the broom and tells the kids to go downstairs and when they do it turns out to be a surprise party for Ron and Hermione which is adorable. The so sweetest sweet. thing. And at the party Harry learns that Sirius wasn't a prefect, James wasn't a prefect, and Lupin says he thinks he only was made a prefect so that he could try to keep James and Sirius in line. <laughs> so yep. he, Harry instantly feels way better about the situation and then is just happy for Ron and Hermione. So he's a, he's a good turnaround thanks to the Order of the Phoenix people. Mundungus and the twins are bartering over venomous tentacula seeds, <laughs> and Harry joins in on the conversation, and after helping them, he finally realizes, oh, wait, are Arthur and Molly going to hate me when they eventually find out that I funded the joke shop? Because they are not going to be pleased about that at all. So yeah. he starts having this internal freak out about that situation. Which is totally justified, because Mrs. Weasley's wrath is terrifying. <laughs> Yes, it really, really is. And she will definitely be mad. Oh, 100%. (laughs) Moody then tries to cheer up Harry by showing him a picture of the original Order of the Phoenix, but seeing people like the Longbottoms and his parents actually does the opposite effect and makes him sad and nervous about stuff. And the narrator describes Moody naming every single person in the picture, which takes 
two pages, which makes me think, does J.K. Rowling have no editor? Because this was obnoxious. <laughs> it's a bunch of names you're never going to hear again and describe what they look like and all this other stuff. And I just flipped past the two pages because I'm like, what's going on? But they all like, why die. Like, that's what's so horrifying yes. about it is that like, and they, yeah. or they like, they, and he says it so casually. Like, mm-hmm. I, I think mm-hmm. what's so interesting about Moody in this book is like, we feel like we know who Moody is because we spent an entire book mm-hmm. with him, but it wasn't Moody. That no. then like this guy shows up and it is Moody and he's exactly the same. Like Barty Crouch Jr. Mm-hmm. did a really good job of like impersonating this crazy, yeah. crazy, like vigilant dude. Paranoid man. And the way that he just like casually describes like, oh yeah, like that person vanished. This person, it took five Death Eaters to kill them. Like, yeah. you know, this person died like a hero. This person was found in bits. It, like it is really jarring particularly when I, I remember reading these books when I was basically you know like growing up and mm-hmm. by the time that the seventh book came out I was like I was 17 I was Harry's age and then like in that book it gives a context of a year and you kind of start to do math about like okay like when was Harry born so when did mm-hmm. his parents die and like you know kind of doing the math on how old his parents are they yes. they were 21 when they died like all yeah. of these people were in their early 20s and that's terrifying mm-hmm. for Harry to like look at a photo of people that are all like seven years older than him and be like, oh, here's the gruesome ways in which they died. Oh, yeah, <laughs> terrifying. It makes so much sense of why Harry is so shook by this. Yeah. So he gets petrified, runs upstairs, and when he does, he sees Ron's dead body. Oh, and for a second, I was like, what the fuck is going on? And I was like, oh, right, the boggart. <laughs> but for a split second, I was very concerned and confused. Well, and Harry is too, like, the way that he, like, the, the way that he reacts, where it's like, you know, he, like, instantly freezes. And, like, I don't know, I, I, I love that moment because you're like, oh, like, Harry and Ron love each other so much. They're such real bros, mm-hmm. and it's so nice. I love their friendship. Oh, it's great. So it is Mrs. Weasley dealing with the Boggart, and she can't defeat it because basically every time she ridiculouses it, it just turns into another dead kid. So it rotates through all her actual children. It becomes Harry at one point. So she's sobbing as she keeps doing ridiculous. And then Lupin comes in, saves the day, and Mrs. Weasley is just distraught. She says she dreams about this all the time. She fears about the family being in danger since so many are in the order. All this other stuff, which is so sad. It's Mrs. So Weasley sad. is so sweet. And She's the fact that, like, Harry is one of the dead bodies that she sees. Yeah. Like, I just, I love, oh, found family is so mm-hmm. good. Yeah. So Sirius and Lupin cheer her up by saying that the Order outnumbers Death Eaters now, which was the opposite of last time. They said something like the Death Eaters outnumbered the Order by 20 to 1, which is Jesus crazy. Christ, how, yeah. how many people <laughs> liked Voldemort? That seems absurd. That, that does seem crazy. Seems obnoxious. Either that or the order was just very tiny. Yeah. Harry feels dumb after this that earlier he's worried about stuff so trivial like a badge and if people are going to get mad at him for funding a joke shop now that life and death are at stake. Oh. And then that's the final thought of chapter nine. <laughs> 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 Yay! Woo! Yay! M- mortality! Yay. So chapter 10, Luna Lovegood. My first note immediately, oh, right, she's important and people like her, which was a similar reaction when Tonks was introduced earlier. Oh, was, yeah. There's a lot of characters that I know exist but know nothing about, and this book has talked about all of them. So Tonks, Bellatrix, and Luna Lovegood are these three very important characters mm-hmm. that I knew existed but knew nothing about. Yeah. So we get introduced to Luna. So Fred and George... <laughs> do this great thing where they knock Ginny down two flights of stairs <laughs> by accident because they don't want to carry their luggage but instead are just using magic for it and I, and I know it is not funny for someone to fall down two flights of stairs but this is absolutely hilarious it is, it is so funny just had like also like Mrs. Weasley and Mrs. Black just like shouting over each other like Mrs. Weasley's like concerned about her daughter and and Mrs. Black is just like screaming racist bullshit. Like it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's good comedy. It is good. And and the one thing that's good about the Wizarding World is since healing is so easy, like you break your arm, it gets healed as soon as someone does the right spell on it. Anytime someone gets hurt, it's really not the worst thing in the world. So, you know, worst case scenario, Ginny's hurt for 10 seconds and then Mrs. Weasley does a Pomfrey spell yeah. and then she's fine. So you can, I don't feel as bad laughing about Ginny falling down two flights of stairs. It's true. It's not like she'll have to have like a broken arm for the whole semester. Like she'll be fine. Yeah. It, oh man. Can you imagine if we had real wizarding medicine? It'd be so good. Just get over any broken bone in a minute and God, a half. that would be amazing. Use some Skelligro <laughs> overnight. God, so that does not sound amazing. <laughs> so they start heading over to King's Cross and they need to do so on foot. They are delayed by Sturgis not showing up for his guard duty, which... I 
thought is either very innocent or he's dead. And you <laughs> learn you learn later that he's not dead, which yeah. is good. There's one of two ways this things like that can go. But he's been arrested. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Sirius is acting hyper as hell in dog mode. He's chasing his tail. He's running outside. He's barking at stuff, which makes sense because it's the first time he's been outside in forever. Yeah. And they get to the station and he starts acting very not dog-like. Like, he stands up on his hind legs and puts his arms on Harry's shoulder. He chases after the train and does all these things where, uh, it's serious. Like, no, You gotta be stop. incognito. <laughs> you, even, even your incognito form is a giant black it's dog. It's a huge black dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not like you're something innocent, like a beagle or something. And also, it's like magical creatures definitely like act like a little bit differently than normal pets. But sure. wizards don't really have dogs, as far as we know. You know, it's yeah. like they've got like cats, owls, heard rats, it. or toads. And it's like we don't really know of anybody having a pet dog. So like a ginormous yeah. dog being at the train <laughs> station seems weird. Definitely. So as the train is leaving, Fred and George immediately two seconds into the train departing go well can't chat all day we have business with lee and leave to talk to lee jordan <laughs> they're so fantastic they're ron the and hermione awkwardly tell harry like oh hey we're, we're actually supposed to go to the prefect carriage so it's just Ginny and harry together finding a carriage laying the foundation for their marriage <laughs> which is sweet <laughs> so they go they go to find a new carriage and a side note that I wrote when I was reading this was that Ron's reaction to finding out that Harry likes Ginny, whenever that happens, it better be the best reaction ever. It, I'm, I have really high standards for how Ron reacts when Harry's like, oh, by the way, I have a huge crush on your sister. And... I'm looking forward to it. I think more than anything. I am. I am. There are so many things that I'm just like excited for you to get to based on things yes. you said just in this conversation. <laughs> this is every person that I have on the podcast. And like things you've said in the podcast previously where I'm just sort of like, oh man, like you're like, you're either you're so wrong or you're, you're so right. And yep. just, oh man, it's going to be so This good. is every guest that I have. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're just grinding their teeth. Like I want to tell you I things, tell but you. I can't. That's why I'm so excited for when I find finally finish the books because I can finally have free open source yes. no worries conversations with people <laughs> because I, I talk with Julia Shafini of Spirits almost every day about Harry Potter. We'll <laughs> G-chat at, at work about whatever whatever I'm, I'm reading or whatever I previously read and there's so many times where she'll say, oh, I can't wait till you're done with these books. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Just there's so many things. There's so many oh, things. Man. There's so much to talk about. Uh, yes. So they find Neville in a cart and his toad is named Trevor, which I think is an interesting name choice for a, a toad. Wait, had you not met Trevor before this? I don't know if he didn't was have a name. Trevor. I, they, oh. I, think, I think they mentioned that he had a, a toad, but I think this was the first time they said his name was Trevor. <laughs> I love uh, that. His either name that or I missed it. I just feel like Trevor is interesting because I'm a big proponent of naming pets really boring names. Like I think the best dog name is Kevin. That's my <laughs> like if I had a dog, I would name it Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> and and I feel like everything in the wizarding world has these crazy names like Crookshanks yeah. or Pig Widgeon. And then he's got Trevor, which is this weird middle ground where it's not super boring, like naming it Bill or Bob or right. Steve. But it's this weird middle ground of <laughs> a semi-interesting white guy name. <laughs> and I just don't know how to feel about it. I feel like it's perfect for, for Neville. It's like yeah. it's just sort of like... Not extraordinary, but like mm -hmm. it has some stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. So Neville says that all the compartments are full and Ginny notices that's not true. There's one over there that is completely empty except for Luna Lovegood. So Luna is described as being quirky and dotty. She's wearing a butterbeer cap necklace, which is dope. <laughs> she has her wand behind her ear, which shows she has a bunch of swag. And she has an upside down quibbler magazine, which means she, uh, she likes a challenge. Uh, <laughs> but then you, you later learn why. Uh, at one point, she just turns to Harry and goes, you're Harry Potter. And he goes, I know I am, which is <laughs> like, oh, oh, so good. <laughs> so good. Dry uh, Harry is my favorite Harry. Yes, it's really good. And and it makes me think of any time someone tall gets the, oh, you're really tall <laughs> thing, which I, I feel so bad for all my friends that are very tall. Oh. And I love asking my very tall friends what their reactions are to people. Just, you know, because they'll say, oh, wow, you're so tall. Or, oh, how's the weather up there? The, the best thing I ever saw was this was I went to VidCon way back in my YouTube days and there was a tall guy who had business cards. I think he was six, seven and he had business cards that literally just said, yes, I am tall. How astute of you. The weather up here is the same as it is down there. 
and I, and I don't play basketball. <laughs> and oh my God. Amazing. It was, just like here, uh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm so tired of this. And I think that that's that is great. dope. That is that is a real move. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Very powerful. She asks Neville who he is, and he says, I'm nobody, which is just oh Neville, come on, man. <laughs> Neville. So, so sad. So you learn that Luna is Ginny's year, but she's at Ravenclaw. So she's a big old nerd. And I have a prediction right away. Uh, this is super early and I have no grounds to go on it, but I'm predicting that she marries Neville. It's, I'm just throwing it. I have no idea if this is going to happen or not, but I just think it would be so perfect if the two couples are in this cart together. So I'm throwing throwing my hat in the Neville and Luna ring, but I... I will say nothing. Okay, good. <laughs> So, I do like here, though, how when he, after he says, I'm nobody, Ginny's like, no, you're not. You're Neville Longbottom. And there are definitely, like, a couple moments throughout throughout these books where I'm like, Ginny and Neville. Like, I could see I could see yeah. an, an AU in which, like, that really works. Like, I could and see they them went really to, working. they went to the Yule Ball together, right? They did, yeah. So there's something there's there, something maybe. there. Or at least, yeah. they're, at least they're friends. <laughs> so Neville is happy to show up his birthday gift, which is a Mimbulus Mimbletonia. <laughs> which looks like a tiny cactus, but instead of having spikes, it's got boils. You find out that his uncle got it for him from Assyria, and he wants to, to show it off to Professor Sprout because he thinks it's not even in the Hogwarts greenhouse. That's how rare it is. So Neville just nerding out. One adorable plant, nerd. Which is adorable. <laughs> so good. So good. So narrator Harry is super douchey to Neville <laughs> because he calls Neville's memory abysmal. He doesn't understand why he gives a shit about plants. People can like things that are different from, from you. It's like, come on, narrator Harry. Like, you don't have to be mean. Real Harry's mean enough. <laughs> there are definitely times when, like, Harry is, like, such a cliched, like, high school jock. Yeah, exactly. You know, he's, like, the star athlete. He's, like, doesn't really pay attention in class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, like, you know, marries his best friend's sister and, like, kind of, like, makes fun of nerds. Uh -huh. And it's like, all right, Harry, like, reel it in. You're, you're not better <laughs> than Neville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Harry asks if it does anything, which is a dick question. And <laughs> Neville says, oh, I'll show off its defense mechanism. So he goes to poke it with a quill and green stink sap goes everywhere. It goes over Harry's face uh, because he was holding Trevor so he can't block it. And of course, just as this happens, Cho Chang walks by, classic sitcom hijinks, <laughs> and he looks so embarrassing. Uh, I, th I thought this was pretty lame that this happened. It was just like, like, uh such low hanging fruit of a situation i was uh <laughs> every time i i read this book i like cho chang and harry less as a thing like i i remember <laughs> yeah. like when i read this for the first time i was like i was such a sucker for and kind of like any like you know awkward mm -hmm. romance and it was like it, oh, it yeah. felt very real to me and it, it still does feel real but i'm just sort of like ugh, like can we not do this? Like this whole situation is not great because you're basically just a replacement for her dead boyfriend. And it's like, mm -hmm. just show me more of, of Ron and Hermione bickering, please. Yes. That's what I care about. The only real redeeming thing about Cho and Harry is that it's interracial, which is a huge yeah. step for the Harry Potter world. Absolutely. And like, that's about it. I like Cho Chang as a character, just like the way that mm -hmm. like Harry, like I never really got why Harry liked her other than like, oh, she's really pretty and she's good at Quidditch. And it's like... It's literally the only two things she's described. The only yeah. things we know about Cho Chang is that she is good at Quidditch, she is pretty, or specifically has a pretty face, yeah. and that she's popular. And we would assume that she is Asian based off her name. Yes. But those are like the four things we know about Cho Chang. And Harry basically only likes her because she's pretty and good at Quidditch and popular. It's the most shallow reasoning for liking someone. But that being said, at age 14 or 15 makes so, so much, much sense. sense because when i was in eighth grade i wasn't like oh wow you know ali de camp has these great moral values i was like no ali de camp is really cute <laughs> that's what it came down to yeah of course like that's exactly that's exactly what harry should you know why harry should be crushing but just like as a, a 26 year old i'm just sort of like ugh, <laughs> like this is so boring <laughs> and it's why she and cedric <laughs> yeah. were so good together is because they were both like pretty kind good quidditch players who are popular yep. and it's mm -hmm. like great that, that's that's perfect they would have had a very nice life together yeah they're, they're like a bachelor couple yeah like bachelor bachelorette on abc couple <laughs> where it's like oh great they're pretty and semi-interesting fun uh, enjoy each other you'll yeah. have a great boring exactly. life together. like you're perfect for each other this is great <laughs> so Ginny cleans it up with a scourgeify spell 
Ron and Hermione then return, and they say that Malfoy is a Slytherin prefect, of course, and so is Pansy Parkinson. Great. This will be so much fun. <laughs> Hermione, Hermione asks, or Hermione states, I don't know how Pansy got to be a prefect when she's thicker than a concussed troll, <laughs> which just proves that she is the best. The best insulter in the whole book is Hermione. She also calls her a cow, which just sounds like so yep. mean coming from Hermione. <laughs> like... Yeah, I feel like that's a British thing, though. I feel like oh, I hear a definitely. Lot of people calling but just people like cow. hearing Hermione like rag on some other girl just always like weirds me out. And it's like, yeah, it's Pansy, and Pansy sucks. But like, the good thing about Hermione hating her is that it's justified. Oh, one hundred percent. She hates her is because Pansy is a terrible person. Yes, it's not like the boy that Hermione likes has a crush on Pansy or Pansy's pretty. It's just straight up Hermione knows Pansy's that Pansy sucks garbage. and is mean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ron announces who the Hufflepuff prefects are, which bumps our number of people we know at Hufflepuff to three. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he says that one of the Ravenclaw prefects is Padma, and Luna hits him with, you went to the ball with her. And Ron says, yeah, I know I did, which is perfect because it was the exact <laughs> response that Harry gave, and he didn't hear it, which just, ah, uh, they're, they're bros. So they're good. such good it's bros. so good. <laughs> and they're on the same way. Like. Luna confirms that Padma says she did not have a good time at the ball because Ron wouldn't dance with her. And Luna says she wouldn't mind, though, because I don't like dancing, which makes me like Luna a little bit less. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm such a proponent of dancing. And, and you, not, you don't have to be good. Like, the, the only bad dancer is the person that doesn't dance. And I'm such a proponent for just, like, get out there and have fun and don't worry about what people say. Because the only person that looks bad at a wedding or a prom or a dance of any sort is the person sitting on the side just Get out there and enjoy the music. I completely agree. and I. But I think coming from Luna, I'm like, oh, you're so weird all the time that like you must genuinely not like dancing. You know what? You're right. Actually, you know? you're completely right. <laughs> I'm like, because you are who you are. Like, you have no shame. Yeah. It's not a, I'm going to stand on the side because I'm afraid of what people will think. It's probably just like, I do not enjoy this activity. I don't like this. I will not partake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've done, you're right. I've done a complete 180. This is so true. Yes. <laughs> Ron says that as prefects, they're supposed to patrol the cars and they're allowed to give out punishments. And he says he wants to get Crab and Goyle in trouble as soon as possible. <laughs> Hermione says, this is horrible. And, he's, and he responds, well, yeah, I got to get him before Malfoy eventually gets Harry, which is pretty valid. That's very valid. That's, that's Ron looking Super out for valid. his bro. Like, he's very good at that. Mm -hmm. He's a bro above all else. Yeah. So he mentions that he wants to make Crab do lines, specifically lines <laughs> that I must not look like a baboon's backside, which isn't the greatest of jokes. No. Everyone laughs a little bit, but Luna <laughs> loses her shit. <laughs> and Ron even gets to the point where he's like, that, that wasn't that funny. And he asks her, are you taking the Mickey? Yeah. Which I don't know if you know what that translates to, but is that asking her if she's high? No, no. Are you taking the Mickey is like, I think, are you... Like, making are you making fun of, fun of me? Like, yeah. Like, are you? Oh, yeah. So are you pretending to laugh so yeah. much? Okay. Different than Got slipping a, him a Mickey Finn, which is, uh -huh. I think, like drugging someone's drink. I don't know. That's a PG Boathouse oh, thing. Okay. Slip, like to slip someone okay. a Mickey Finn is something else. But yeah, to take the Mickey is to like to, to make fun of. Like it's the same thing as like, are you taking the piss? I think. Uh, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it. You know, that's like another thing that the Brits sure. say. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love British phrases. They're so much fun. They're great. Oh, they're great. So she drops her Quibbler magazine while she was laughing, and you learn that it's a gossip magazine, very much on par with TMZ or um, the National Enquirer, like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Harry notices a cartoon of fudge, and the only reason he notices that it's fudge is because of his, quote, trademark lime green bowler hat. And well, pause for a second. Why has this not been addressed? That his not only. That's definitely come up before, hasn't it? Not that it was lime green. I think they maybe said that he was wearing it, but they didn't. This is the when they say that. It's his trademark item. The identifying thing to know Fudge's style is that he wears a lime green bowler all the time, which I think is the like the only bigger red flag would be if he carried around a giant red flag. Yes. Like, like that's so much concern. Yeah. Like you cannot trust anybody who even owns a lime green <laughs> bowler hat. Like that's the worst like, fashion item I could possibly like, think of. Bowler hat, <laughs> fine. Not necessarily the best. Yeah. But lime green the is, best. that's a tricky color. It's a, and I'm a huge proponent of bright, vibrant colors. I own multiple pairs of pink pants, but lime green is just, there's something about it that. Yeah. And as a hat and with what I imagine is Fudge's British complexion. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to work. It's not. And I'm sad that that wasn't in the movie because I immediately Googled 
Cornelius Fudge movie lime green bowler, and it was all him wearing a black bowler, which uh cop out by the screenwriters. Yeah, <laughs> no, that. you should have you should have gone whole hog on the lime green bowler. <laughs> we, I want the cannon hat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry sees an article titled "Serious Hyphen Black as He's Painted: Notorious Mass Murderer or Innocent Singing Sensation," and he immediately thinks, "I got to figure out what the hell is going on here." So the article cites a witness, and they list her address, which is absurd. <laughs> absolutely ridiculous that Sirius Black is a false name and it's actually Stubby Boardman one of the lead singers of the Hobgoblins band and the witness says that Stubby uses this as a fake name and Stubby was with her on a date on the date in question it's this weird thing where she says that like Sirius Black isn't this guy and he was somewhere else but that doesn't make sense because someone still committed the crime and said it was serious black. Like her, yeah. her, the whole article doesn't make any sense. Not even in the sense of haha, no way he'd be in a band disguises this, but her whole alibi is that no, no one was there, but it's the murders happened. Like <laughs> I don't yeah, understand. No, it's, it's utter nonsense. <laughs> Immediately. Harry's like, Oh, this is what kind of magazine this is. Everything here is dumb, <laughs> but he still goes through to flip through the pages. He goes to the Fudge article, which says that Fudge is trying to take over Gringotts. It suggests that Fudge hates goblins and orders them to be cooked into pies. And Harry, at that point, is just, okay, we're done here. Uh, and then gets to one of the pages says that if you hold a picture of these ruins upside down, it spells out a spell which you can turn your enemies into kumquats. And that is explaining why Luna was reading this upside down. Yeah. So she had a good reason. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Hermione then starts talking shit about the Quibbler, and Luna is, says, oh, my dad's the editor, which is the classic make fun of someone, <laughs> and they're like, well, you know. <laughs> that was actually me, yeah. yeah <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so she tries to backtrack it, but it doesn't work. And then, of course, like we do every single time we're in a train to Hogwarts, Malfoy comes in with Crab and Goyle, talking shit. But before he can say anything, <laughs> Harry immediately goes, what? Right away. <laughs> it's so good. It's so amazing. <sighs> I know that their patience for each other just dwindles progressively. <laughs> and it's good because it matches my, I have no patience for this scene because it's happened four times already. It's like, great, we're on yeah. the train. Malfoy's going to shit talk Harry. So I'm very glad that Harry's like, all right, I know what's going to happen. Everyone knows what's going to happen. Let's cut to the chase. I'm trying to there's there's one there's one like Malfoy I okay actually never mind that's because this this scene happens again in the sixth book and that's what I'm thinking of so I will stop saying anything (laughs) cool yeah so Malfoy (laughs) goes right into it says I unlike you have been made a prefect so I can give out punishments and Harry hits him with well you unlike me are a git so get out of here and leave (laughs) us alone which oh fantastic fantastic Malfoy says that he'll be dogging Harry's footsteps if he's out of line. And he doesn't just say the word dogging. He says the word dogging in italics, which means he emphasizes the word dogging. So clearly he knows about Sirius Black and this is not good. I wrote no in my notes 17 times because this is (laughs) is very bad because now Lucius knows and that's not good for anyone. Yeah. Yeah. The train finally gets to Hogwarts. And rather than being greeted by Hagrid, they hear the sharp voice of a woman. And my first thought is, oh, no, is this Umbridge? But it's Professor Grubblyplank. And Harry starts freaking out, thinking that, oh, no, did Hagrid leave? What's going on with Hagrid? And he's completely shook because it's just like a calming force for him that I'm back at the school where I feel comfortable. And the first person I get to see is Hagrid. And right off the bat, that's kind of been ruined. So it kind of throws Harry for a bit of a loop. One of my favorite bits out of all these books are, is the end of the fourth book when, you know, after he's like in Dumbledore's office and stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's just like this, this tonal shift when they're talking about, you know, Voldemort coming back and all this kind of stuff where it's like, Oh, things are, things are going to be different now. Yeah. Like that's, that's the mm-hmm. point where it goes from like a kid series to like this very dark kind of like YA series. Yeah. And I, I, I love that then she like continues that in these first chapters back at Hogwarts where it's like, things are different in a, in a bad way. Yeah. <laughs> and there's like these creepy horses now. Mm. Hagrid's gone. The new defense against the dark teacher is terrible. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just, it really like ups the stakes in a great way. Yeah, the series really takes a turn the second Harry grabs the port key at the end of the fourth book. I feel like once yeah. that happens, I don't know if this is a thing, but in my brain is always imagining the world that's going on. And everything was kind of like light, mm-hmm. with, like this greenish, yellowy hue of, of happiness. And then once he grabs the port key, everything from then on is like dark purple. <laughs> it's, everything yeah. is not. Because it's so unexpected. Yeah. It's really, 
Oh, it's terrifying. That whole scene in the graveyard. And from then on, it's just, it's like, oh, wow. Okay. This is a new book series. And, and people, people on Twitter give me grief that I always call it in the podcast, a series of children's novels. And when I went to get the fifth book out of my local library, I had to go to the children's section and not the young adult section. But you're right that once that turn happens, like one through four, for the most part, definitely children's books. But yeah. I'm getting the sense that five through seven are distinctly not and yeah and it makes sense someone on the airplane when i was i was i was traveling this weekend and i was reading the books on the plane and someone asked me oh would these be good for my 11 year old son and i was like yes if he reads them as he gets older it will be perfect yeah because they will start as fun happy little children's novels and then once he starts to go through puberty he'll get to the part where harry's going through puberty and stuff gets real and and he can understand oh someone died this is this is okay because i'm old enough to be okay with this exactly like they're they're written for the age group that harry is in mm-hmm. in each book you yes. know and like by the time that you get to the seventh book and he's 17 it's like it's dealing with these huge like you know big themes yeah. of, of mortality and love and death and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and is and is dark in a way that like that the, the darkness starts at the end of four and then just like it gets darker and darker and darker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Speaking of darker, Harry gets on what is normally the horse's carriages, but instead it's winged demon skeleton horses, <laughs> which I don't know what the hell these things are, but what's going on? It's like it's like a demonic hippogriff came, like traveling and Harry sees them and then tries to tell Ron like, yo, what's going on? And Ron asks, what are you talking about? And Harry responds, you don't see this giant winged horse? He grabs Ron's face to show, which is a great (laughs) visual. And Ron just doesn't see anything. And Harry thinks he's gone crazy. But when he gets in the carriage, Luna says, don't worry, I see them too. And then she ends the the Cold chapter. comfort. Yeah, exactly. She ends it with, you're as sane as I am. And my <laughs> initial thought, I was surprised Harry didn't have a thought, but it's like, is that really something you want to hear? Like the craziest yeah. person you've met thus far is like, don't worry, you're just as normal as me. It's like, that's not a compliment, Luna Lovegood. That's you're not- psycho. <laughs> So what is your, uh, what do you, th- what do you think is the deal with these horses? Why do you think they've shown up? I'm thinking that it has something to do with, with seeing evil. Mm. The only major thing that's happened is that he's interacted with Voldemort. Like Voldemort has touched him. Mm. Like before seeing these, Voldemort did not touch him. Like he's run into Voldemort, like with the unicorn thing and with Quirrell and all that. But this is the only time Voldemort made physical contact with him and that's like the biggest change that's happened so i feel like it might have something to do with maybe they're kind of like dementors where they're they were evil things but turned good or at least are doing a good thing and and that has somehow changed it so i'm thinking maybe luna has some sort of like dark past too or something that happened to her also so I guess my my guess would just be it has to be I mean this is always my guess for everything is that oh, it's got to be some Voldemort's got to be behind this like Voldemort did something it's, it's always a good guess it's like oh man this diary seems weird well it's probably Voldemort or like like everyone's first, well it's probably <laughs> it's Voldemort like, yeah and so I, I I feel like Voldemort has to be something because it's the only shift I could get either that or it's the fact that he's witnessed death. That could be the only other thing mm. is that he's seen someone die. And so those are the only two major shifts that have happened in between. So that would be my guess. Well, you'll just have to wait and see. We'll just have to see indeed. So that is the end <laughs> of chapter 10. And that is the end of this episode of Potterless. But don't worry, Lauren and listeners, we will be doing more chapters with Lauren like five seconds after we stop recording. But in two weeks time <laughs> in the real world. Um, but thank you, listeners, so much for listening. Lauren, thank you so much for being a part of this episode. Thank you for having me on. Uh, do you want to give a little plug to the Bright Sessions a podcast that's yes. sweeping the nation? Um, I write a, a science fiction <laughs> podcast. It's a radio radio drama um and you can find that at thebrightsessions.com you can search bright sessions on itunes all that it is about people with supernatural abilities in therapy yeah and i'm i feel like we probably reference harry potter at some point i think you do at one point i feel like you. i, th- might I think have, we I think do. You definitely did but yeah it's basically like the x-men with high school to college slash young adult age kids but it's like super deep and you filled with feels <laughs> so like it's all feels it's sometimes only feels. you gotta sit down when you're listening like i'll listen to a lot of that like a big time when I listen to podcasts when I'm like cleaning or doing dishes and specifically Same. when I was listening to the last like two to three episodes of season three which just ended I, I had to like stop everything I was doing and I just I sat down on my couch with my phone just like pointed at my face because <laughs> I was like too much is happening I can't multitask it's a great podcast series yeah uh, i love hearing that thank you thank you everyone. so much but that's the end for this episode and uh until next time as they say in hogwarts every day wizard on <laughs> 
Potterless is created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Andreas Ozelby, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vanderslice, Sadie Bear, Emily Whiffen, Chandra Cruz, Jesse Horgan, Maggie Zobazek, Natalie Klobuchar, and Deborah Wilkes. Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you would rate and review us on iTunes, that would help us so much. It helps more people find the podcast and makes our team larger. You can also find us on Facebook.com slash Potterless, Twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast, and of course, our website, PotterlessPodcast.com. Thank you guys so much for listening, and until next time, wizard on!